finished uh, the conquest and we're going, we're talking about the Shiites and the different groups of Shiites. Yeah? You said to remind you about Hidden Imam. Yeah, I'm going to go into the Hidden Imam, thanks, that's good. I uh, appreciate that. I'm going to, yeah, the different groups of Shiites, which, which have to do with the Hidden Imam. And uh, I think I told you that the Hidden Imam is a doctrine that really does floor non Shiites. I mean, it's, it's really a Buddhist doctrine, if you want to get right down to it. In fact, it's not just a Buddhist doctrine, as uh, people like Al and my friend over here can uh, attest to have been in other classes on the Second Temple period. It's a uh, little like the Buddha, a little like the Christ, a little like what in the Judeo-Christian groups was called the primal Adam. Yeah, they may not be sorted in the proper way, but you'll get it. Um, hopefully the, that, that one doesn't have them on both sides. Skip that one out. Skip that one. Stop thinking on both sides. Save that for last. We got plenty of other ones in there. Just save them. I think I remember. There's the, uh, Isaac's all 20 and I don't think there's 20 people in here. 21 in fact, Isaac's all. So. The extra. Thank you. Don't give out to each person, that's all. So, um, the primal atom is really the key for this part of the world. And the primal atom was an idea that Judeo-Christian groups, the groups I've been talking about, the groups intermediate between Judaism and Christianity, the groups Islam is referring to as Salvayan, and doesn't realize it's referring to as Salvayan. When it uses Salvayan, it thinks it's talking about southern Yemen, but that was the old name of southern Yemen back in the uh, 10th century BC. Whereas these groups are functioning around the time of Muhammad in southern Iraq. And it's spelled differently anyway. It has a different letter. Uh, one is an uh, ayan, the other is an olive. It's definitely not southern Yemen, and it's definitely not those Salvayans. Not the Queen of Sheba type subbands in the Bible. The subbands of southern Yemen are an equivalent to what the Bible calls the Queen of Sheba. The subbands that are functioning in Iraq and northern Syria are uh, intermediate groups between Jews and Christians. And they are daily baptizers, and, but they are also to some extent Gnostic. And they have the idea of the primal Adam. For them, there was a first Adam, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, if, you, if, if you've read it. The first Adam was born of the dust, and the second Adam, he said, was born of the Spirit, and so on. And of course, Jesus is, for him, the second Adam. So he thinks Adam is incarnated in Jesus. And I already told you that Muhammad has that idea to some extent in the Surah 2, where he puts Adam above the angels. The only way Adam can be above the angels is if he's a supernatural being. It's not that men are above the angels, it's that Adam was above the angels, the supernatural Adam, the primal Adam. Now these are very technical doctrines that I venture to say no one who teaches Islamic studies either teaches or knows anything about uh, because they don't study the period that I'm talking about at all. And so you won't get this in any other class. So you'll say to someone, oh, this is what that is, and they'll look at you, what, what are you talking about? They wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. But I can assure you that that's what it's all about. And this is where Shiism came in contact with these groups. And so the idea, um, I think, was absorbed. Now, where did the primal Adam idea come from? I think the primal Adam idea came from contact probably with Buddhist groups. Now, I think the Christ is also derivative of that. What Paul calls the Christ <coughs> is not the Christ in Palestine, because the Christ in Palestine, Jesus as a man, was not a supernatural being until the literature turned him into a supernatural being. Whatever Jesus was, he was a, he walked around and did said some things, and I'm not sure what he said, and he was killed. By whom and how and so on, I'm not going to argue about those points. But that's what we know about the human being Jesus. Now, what the later people said about Jesus, his resurrection and so on and so forth, 
That comes in the documents that were written later about him by other people putting an ideological significance into his uh, presence and his um, walk around. So in those materials, Jesus becomes, if you like, a um, not just a supernatural being, he acts like a, Gre a Greco-Roman god. You know, the Greco-Roman gods visited the earth, Asclepius was a healer, you touched Asclepius and you got healed. Uh, and this is what happens with Jesus, he walks around, someone touches them, and they, blood stops flowing in their, uh, um, uh, I don't know, one woman has a, a 10, 20 year menstrual flow of blood, touches Jesus and the menstrual flow stops, I mean, this is all very charming, but it's Hellenistic mystery religion novelizing, it's nothing to do with history. Uh, I know people like to think it as a struggle, and they keep looking for the miracle worker who can do these things, and of course they never find anything but charlatans. Well, uh, so that's the difference, you see, between Jesus and the charlatans. Jesus could. Well, Jesus could on what testimony? Someone's written document that is very unreliable. And as, uh, so you're taking a, an unreliable uh, uh, UFO sighting sort of uh, material, an abduction type of... Uh, material not from today but from 20 centuries ago and then you're, you're, you're betting your whole life on it. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't take that bet if I were you, but you're welcome to do it and I'm not trying to discourage you, I'm just telling you it's not something university would entertain. And uh, it, it wouldn't even get into a courtroom, it's only something that will get into religious institutions because religious institutions are prepared to entertain that sort of claim. Islamic, Jewish, and Christian. I'm not claiming any one of them, that's a religious function. The fact that uh, you know, the Quran was dictated by an angel, is the same kind of claim. Uh, the fact that Muhammad uh, never studied anything is the same kind of claim. Uh, uh, things like that. Yeah, it, it passes in religious institutions, but it's not going to pass in a university. I apologize for that. But the reason it can't pass in a university is the people in the physics department would laugh me out the door. They said the same as they laughed out the door of the creationists. You know, <laughs> they're not going to accept the uh, uh, intelligent d design in the uh, biology Darwinian department. And uh, they're not going to let me talk like this in, uh, in uh, the computer science world where things have to be uh, subjected to proper proof. So what I'm saying is Jesus walks around like a Hellenistic Greco-Roman god. He, uh, he exercises spirits, he raises from the dead, he heals, people fall down in front of him, they kiss his feet, they wash his feet. This is how Dionysus would have been treated in the Greco-Roman stories. You know, now believers, which are three quarters of this room here, and about everyone you'll meet in this whole area of the world, don't like to hear this kind of thing. It annoys them. You're not supposed to talk about religion and politics. If you talk about politics, you're going to annoy three quarters of the people. If you talk this way about religion, you're going to annoy 95% of the people. So I suggest to you don't, don't talk like this. But on the other hand, in the university, we have to be honest about it. We're talking about the primal Adam idea. And whether you like it or not, Jesus is presented in the scripture like a Greco-Roman god in the way Dionysus or Apollo or any of the other ones would have been appointed. This will not fly in the Middle East. It didn't fly in Palestine, and it doesn't fly in Islam. Period. And, uh, you know, Muhammad, as you see, is totally against it. There's no intercession, you know. Uh, there's nobody can, uh, you know, constantly, 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 he, he, he harangues against that particular uh, idea, though he's not sure how to deal with Jesus, because he's not a very big intellectual, but he knows that this is not a supernatural being, and he knows that this person cannot intercede for you. Whatever else he knows, I can't tell you. Now, the fact that Jesus is not a supernatural being comes from the Ebionites, who are in, embedded in this part of the world. They have the doctrine, and it's in all church literature, that they saw Jesus as a, a man only advanced among other men through his uh, practice of righteousness. And the fact uh, that he, uh, you know, was morally superior. And finally, that he was born by natural generation, not supernatural generation. So, oh, where'd they get these ideas? Ah, they were the original Christians in, in, in the Middle East. It's not that where they got the ideas, it's where the others got the ideas. 
They were the original Christians in Palestine. They are the group reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls who over and over again talk about themselves as Ebion, Ebionites, poor ones. Hebrew, in Ebion is the Hebrew word for, for poor. And we know that that was their doctrine. And in addition, the church, as represented by Eusebius in the 4th century, <coughs> who imposed Christianity on the Roman Empire, Eusebius was Constantine's bishop, and he's the one who called all the councils of Nicaea, and he's the one that uh, tutored Constantine, he told Constantine what, what to believe and so on. Constantine was a military, was what you'd call a military ape, a brute. He killed members of his own family, you know, he was totally brutal, there was nothing Christian from his toe to his head, except that he saw the usefulness of using Christian believers as part of his army. And uh, he made some promises on that score. He said he claimed to see the cross of God in the sky, and if he won the battle of so-and-so bridge, he would become a Christian or something like that. And of course, he won the battle of so-and-so bridge, so he claimed to be a Christian, but he didn't really accept conversion until he was on his deathbed because he wanted to uh, settle all scores and kill as many members of his family and other people that got, it, got in his way as he could, and therefore he didn't want to uh, you know, uh, be an official Christian lest he be blamed for this. Then on his deathbed, he confessed everything, uh, apologized, and uh, uh, accepted a conversion. This is Constantine who imposed Christianity on the Western world. That's fair enough. But Eusebius is the man who taught Constantine, and he was his direct official, and he organized all the councils. He was a bishop from Caesarea. You can read his books. And he is the one who tells you that the Ebionites have these ideas, which he abhors. And he tells you that the reason they had these ideas is because they had a, a, their a conception of Christ was poverty-stricken. Why does he call their conception of Christ poverty-stricken? Ah, because he's laughing at their name, the poor, Ebionites, poverty, people of um, poverty. He said, yeah, not only were they poor, did they go around as poor people, their ideas were poor, their Christology was poor, and their intellectual foundation was poor. So he's laughing at them. But in fact, he doesn't tell you that they're the original people in Palestine, and it's he that's bringing in the Hellenistic other ideas into things. I want to go any further than that. I, I do that as a background to the primal Adam idea. Because these groups, like the Ebionites, did have the primal Adam idea. Now, as that moved westward, that turned into Paul's Christ idea. Christ is a Greek word. It has nothing whatever to do with Palestine. It was never used in Palestine. And it's, a, it's only encountered in Paul's letters. Jesus didn't go around saying, I am the Christ. Whatever he said, I don't know. But he didn't go around saying, I am the Christ, because I doubt if he even knew Greek. Uh, and so on. So it, it was a word that was totally unknown to him. The person who uses it is Paul, and Paul talks about being in touch. He doesn't care what people on earth say. So I don't care what the leadership of my church says. I don't care what any flesh and blood, blood says. I didn't learn this from any flesh and blood, he says, in Corinthians or in Romans. I only learned this from Christ Jesus in heaven. So he claims a direct visionary connection with a being, a supernatural being in heaven that he calls Christ Jesus and through that conduit, all of his ideas are presented. Well, you know, Muhammad is doing the same thing with the angel, Gabriel, and so on. But Paul is much more aggressive in this regard and outlines a whole new theology, which we now call Christianity. But as I say in Palestine, <coughs> that particular version of things didn't exist, and it never took hold, as you see in the Middle East, except through the company of the Crusaders. The Crusaders imposed it on parts of Lebanon and so on. It survived a bit in Egypt among the Copts, etc. But in most parts of the Middle East, it was eradicated in favor of a more Judaized, if you like, Islam. Islam doesn't like to think of itself as Judaized, but it is. It, 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 I told you in what way it is and how it follows the Judaistic way. And I'll show you when we do Islamic law now how it is Judaized. But forget that. If you don't know anything about Judaism, you don't realize that you're Judaized, so there is no problem in that. So finally, let's bring it to an end. Somehow, this Buddha, primal Adam, Christ idea, become incarnated in the Imam idea. Because the idea was that, not in normative Christianity, not Pauline Christianity, but in these sectarian Christianities, 
Christ was like a Buddha. He would be incarnated in any generation, any given person. It's in the literature. Simon Magus supposedly taught this. It's in the literature. If you want to read about it, it's in what's called the Pseudo-Clementines. You get all of Simon Magus's doctrine. They're called Pseudo because the church thought they were fake. But all the writings from this period are fake. So to call them Pseudo means that uh, you're denigrating one group of, um, of um, writings. There are writings, false writings, written under the name of Clement. There's two versions. That's why it's plural. Oh, boy, the name of the two versions. But they give all these ideas. They give the whole primal Adam doctrine. They tell you what Simon Magus thought and so on and so forth. They don't like Simon Magus, but they tell you what his ideas are. They even tell you that Simon Magus was a, uh, was a uh, uh, student or follower of John the Baptist. So they know, have a lot of inside information. They know exactly where Simon Magus came from. They know uh, he was a Samaritan. They know where he was born, whereas the, our Gospels only know that... Uh, that Peter and um, Philip confront Simon and Magus in Samaria. They don't tell us that Simon Magus was born in Samaria. But the reason for that is that uh, they know that he was born in Samaria, so they present the confrontations there, but they don't give us that information. So the pseudo Clementines give us more information in this regard than the Book of Acts, for instance. Uh, so in any case, uh, they're called pseudo because they're written in the name of Clement. Clement was the first pope in Rome uh, uh, after Peter. And as it turns out, uh, uh, Clement was a Roman nobleman who met Peter in Rome, came back to Palestine with him, according to these documents, and saw the early church in operation. So this is a kind of opera, opposition acts from the uh, Ebionite point of view. And it, of course, contradicts the regular acts on almost every point. And the main point that it contradicts the regular acts is that um, James is the leader of the early church. That becomes clear in Acts by about chapter 15, but Acts doesn't tell us that any earlier than that. And in addition, the attack on Stephen in Acts is, doesn't, doesn't exist. Stephen doesn't exist in these documents. What happens is Paul attacks James at that point and throws him down the temple steps and leaves him for dead. So the attack on Stephen in the book of Acts is replaced or paralleled in the pseudo-Clementines by a much more um, a much more um, convincing and believable attack on, on James by Paul. I, I don't want to go any further than that, but that's how interesting the pseudo-Clementines are. And they're not new doctrines, they're very old. But of course they're pseudo in the, in the church because they don't go according to early church doctrine, and they think that Paul is the Antichrist. Uh, uh, and uh, I happen to think that they're probably correct on that particular score, but that's my own personal view. It's nothing, you don't have to accept that. But um, in these documents, as I say, Paul is the Antichrist, and I didn't write them, they're written in the second century. Um, all these uh, materials about the primal Adam and so on are, are laid out, and um, you can get an idea of what these groups were believing, and there they tell about the primal Adam putting on new bodies in every generation. It starts with Adam, and then Adam becomes a uh, a new person in every generation and puts on flesh and in every generation there's a there's a new Adam and so on. Well that's the Imam idea. That's the Imam idea. That's 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 it. And that's where they got it from, I'm sure, but I can't prove it. I'm just sure that it's not provable, but I'm sure that's where they got it from. So normative Muslims are right probably to be uh, concerned about this because it's not something that uh, I'm sure Muhammad taught. But it is something was endemic in the areas of Syria and Iraq that they that they went into, and they would have come into very deep contact with. Okay, that's my lecture on the Imam idea. The Imam now in the Pseudo Clementines, uh, one of the teachers of this doctrine is Simon Magus, but there are other teachers of it too. And the Simon and the uh, Pseudo Clementines just assume it is true. I, they imply it comes from John the Baptist. Now the groups, of course, in Syria and in Iraq that we know exist, as I told you, are John the Baptist groups. Um, they've forgotten a lot of these ideas, but they are John the Baptist groups, and as I said, they, they still exist in southern Iraq today. They're not liked by either the Shiite or the Sunnis. They, they, they follow John the Baptist, they bathe, they wear white, they lay on hands, they have priests called Nazareans, uh, not many left. They lived in the marshes, down by the mouth of the Tigris River, and um, 
our friend Saddam Hussein drained the marshes, so he drained their habitat, destroyed their lifestyle. Now, uh, if the uh, peace protesters out on the campus here will allow us, uh, uh, the U.S. is trying to re refill the marshes with uh, the water and naturally, naturally had them. These people will go back to live their whole lifestyle. Of course, if our grave marker people out there have their say about it, uh, we'll all be back in the soup again. Uh, when I was out there today, I said, um, hey, um, hey folks, um, what are these markers for? Oh, this is Arlington National Cemetery uh, West. I said, oh, okay, I'm, you're commemorating Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah, yeah, we are. I said, uh, well, uh, what else are they supposed to represent? Oh, well, they're all the U.S. casualties in Iraq. I said, oh, so this is an anti-war demonstration, right? I said, it's a peace demonstration. I said, oh, well, that's good. I said, uh, why don't you have some markers for the 60, 100, 150, 200,000 people Saddam Hussein butchered? Oh, oh that, that's not our object. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, okay, so we're commemorating America. So America's the only dead that matter in the world, presumably. The fact that uh, 250, 300, 400,000 other people have been butchered by somebody and someone tried to stop it, that doesn't matter. So, anyway, these are something that really gets my, really gets me. I apologize. I get really, I get really angry because they play on people's <coughs> obvious uh, upset by the situation, and nobody, everybody would be upset. Nobody wants to see 2,000 American casualties. Nobody wants to see 3,000 people uh, dead when the World Trade Center comes down. But to you know, just go around like this is happening in a vacuum. Maybe could have been errors were made. Sure, maybe this was the wrong thing to do. But to act like, oh, this is the only thing that matters. The fact that we lose people, that other people lose people, that doesn't matter at all, does it? Well, I don't happen to agree with that. Uh, um, uh, the fact that uh, Hitler was doing what he was doing in the Second World War, uh, do you mean to say that uh, the 500,000 troops the American lost to stop people from, like Hitler from doing what they were doing it was not a, a righteous thing? Should we have just sat here and let him do that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Uh, a lot of people like that would say yes. And, uh, and would, you know, to my mind, mislead the, pu the public into thinking that that was the righteous, peaceful thing to do. I don't personally believe that you have to, whether the political decision is correct, you still have to confront injustice, it seems to me. And all, we were only remiss in not confronting it earlier, when it could have been confronted without great loss. And we were remiss in not confronting Hitler earlier, when he could have been removed without murdering 30 million people. So, to my mind, no, it, the mistake is not confronting it. The mistake is not confronting it at the right time. <laughs> That's when, when it gets more costly. And we know what World War II cost us. I hear the people in the, or, uh, since I'm on this subject and I've worked up, I hear the people on the public radio there, I heard a thing on Italian television, Americans are using phosphorus, uh, phosphorus things in Iraq. Uh, the mean, dirty Americans. So, oh, yeah, well, what did they do in World War II when they were using flamethrowers to burn out uh, caves on Iwo Jima? Uh, do you mean to say you want to protest that they were burning out caves on Iwo Jima? Uh, <laughs> suddenly, this is a this is a great crime to uh, to uh, to you know do this sort of thing. I'm not saying it's right or good or nice, but uh, how come it's okay to do it in Iwo Jima and not okay to do it in Iraq? I don't, uh, I don't follow them, that kind of logic. So uh, I, I just say to my students these things. Uh, I don't have to agree with them. I don't expect anyone to. But uh, just so you can hear a different point of view sometimes, because I don't think from professors.